Well, my friends, we have come to the final night of our mission, and it brings us to the final stage of the third stage of the spiritual life, third stage of spiritual development. We've seen how, as the soul, as a person remains faithful to prayer and renunciation, it eventually advances into contemplation, and also then the dark night of the sense, and if perseveres into the dark night of the spirit. And this opens the person then, disposes them to enter into the third way, the way of union, the way of, of the perfect, which St. John of the Cross calls the mystical marriage, sometimes also called the transforming union. This union is of the wills, because that's the union of love. When the wills are joined, love flourishes. St. John of the Cross explains it in the living flame of love like this, talking about the mystical marriage. The will of God and that of the soul then being one, they unite in one spontaneous and free consent. The soul possesses God through the grace of will and possesses all that it can have by way of will and grace because to its yes, God has corresponded with a true and entire yes of his grace. So there's this mutual consent. That's why the nuptial theme is perfect because I take you, you take me, and together we make the full consent of ourselves, the full surrender. And so there is complete union, complete surrender, and complete possession, one of the other. So that's why the mystical, mystical theme, or the marital theme is functional here because of the complete possession, the soul with God, God with the soul. So having passed through the dark night of the spirit, dark night of the sense, the soul is now fully at rest in the bosom of God. The spousal union with Jesus produces a harmony of one's personality, the entire personality. The effects of the original sin have been subjugated by divine grace and the soul is inebriated with supernatural love. It sounds so attractive, doesn't it? So a, wor a goal worth achieving or trying to achieve. Here the soul has traversed in the way of Christian regeneration as far as it is possible in this life. As far as it's possible in this life. St. John of the Cross defined the mystical marriage as the total transformation into the beloved. So the person becomes an icon of Jesus. A total transformation of the beloved in which both parties give themselves in turn, the one transferring the entire possession of self to the other with a certain consummation of the union of love. So if we possess God completely and he possessed us, there would be no imperfection within us. So the Christian mystics say this is the, the greatest foretaste of the beatific vision that we can have before we come to the end of our earthly lives. It's already a sharing in that, dimly though, a sharing in the, the taste of the beatific vision. So it means a person living heaven on earth, heaven on earth, because we're perfectly united with God. That's what heaven is. Nothing can disturb it at that point. St. John of the Cross in his work, The Living Claim of Love, offers an even more compelling description of the mystical marriage in these words. The soul feels itself to be at last wholly enkindled in divine union. Its palate to be wholly bathed in glory and love. And from the very inmost part of its substance to be flowing veritable rivers of glory, abounding in delights. For it perceives that from its belly are flowing the rivers of living water, which the Son of God said would flow from such souls. It seems to this soul that 
since it is transformed in God with such vehemence and in so lofty a way possessed by him and is adorned with such a marvelous wealth of gifts and virtues. It is very near to the eternal bliss from which it is divided only by a slender web, almost having crossed over. And this and thus, these acts of love of the soul are more precious, and even one of them is of greater merit and worth than all that the soul may have done in its life apart from this transformation, however much this may be. You see, because the, the merits of our acts are valued by our unity with Jesus and the spirit within which we do them in the Lord. So no matter how many great works were done prior to this mystical marriage, they had only so much merit because of the, our own imperfections. When it's a little bit soiled by self-interest, when it's a little bit soiled by desire for a certain ambition, it just creeps in there, you know, in a small way. But now, in the mystical union, the mystical marriage, every act is so meritorious because Jesus is doing it. It's perfect. Jesus is doing it within the person. Well, this is a glorious objective, right? I mean, to live in such a godly state, we would all want to do that. But stepping back, back for a minute, you know, we, we, last night we, we saw the, the challenges of the, the dark night, right? So we say to ourselves, we have questions like, you know, this is a great goal, but, you know, I know who I know. I'm a pretty weak person. I don't. I don't know. I never saw myself even getting near that threshold. Or maybe consider it such an overwhelming project with all the renunciation and excruciating purifications that are involved in order to come to union. It seems like an unattainable goal, right? And even just kind of like a almost discouraging to look at, like it seems like such a steep mountain to, to ascend that <laughs> you feel a little bit discouraged before you even start. Maybe a pipe dream, you know, insurmountable for an ordinary person like me. I'm just a mom, dad, just a student, son, daughter trying to do their thing, you know. Well, that's understandable. We could perceive it that way. So in light of that, though, I now want to offer you some hope. And I'm going to bring this part of our discussion into conclusion now with this point of hope. And it's this, which will be, I think, accessible and appealing to everyone, that it is possible to have this union with Jesus, this perfect union with Jesus, even by another path. And that is the path of Marian consecration. So I want you to listen to some of the passages I'm going to share with you from St. Louis de Montfort. The, they come from To Devotion to Mary. And he would have known Saint John of the Cross, known of Saint John of the Cross. He, he lived 130 years after John of the Cross, but he lived in France. John of the Cross lived in Spain. He would have known about John of the Cross's writings, the Three Ways of the Spiritual Life, the Dark Night, and all of that. So, when he when he offers these insights or this secret, this really it's a secret of the spiritual life. He's doing it in view of his knowledge of the three ways that St. John of the Cross proposes. So, St. Louis de Montfort declared, How many devout souls do I see who seek Jesus, some by one way or by one practice and others by other ways and other practices? And after they have toiled much throughout the night, they say, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Sometimes we feel that way, having 
works so hard in our spiritual life, it seems like we're just right, right at, at box one, starting point. He continues. But the Immaculate Way of Mary and the divine practice that I am teaching, we toil during the day. We toil in a holy place. We toil but little. There is no night in Mary because there is no sin, nor even the slightest shade. Mary is the holy place and the holy of holies where saints are formed and molded. There is a great difference between making a figure in relief by blows of a hammer and chisel and by making a figure by throwing it into a mold. Sanctuaries and sculptures, sculptors labor much to make figures in the first manner, but to make them in the second, they work little and do their work quickly. It goes on to note that St. Augustine calls our Blessed Lady the mold of God, insofar as she molded him within her womb. He said that the mold is fit to cast and mold gods, small g. He who is cast in this mold is presently formed and molded in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ into him. At a slight expense and in a short time, we will become godlike because he has been cast in the same mold which has formed God the Son. If you talk about encouraging words, my friends, that steep hill finally looks like it can be surmounted because we can do it with the Blessed Mother. She's the key, she's the secret. She's the way to pass through those extraordinary avenues without being severely damaged. He knows that as there are secrets of nature to do in a short time, at little cost and with facility, natural operations, so also in a like manner there are secrets in the order of grace to do in a short time with sweetness and facility, supernatural operations such as emptying ourselves of self, filling ourselves with God and becoming perfect. The practice which I disclose is one of these secrets of grace, total consecration to Jesus through Mary. So no one is denied that possibility of total union with the Lord. It is, it is something that we can reach for even in our utter weakness. Last passage, but really, you know, if you've been with us these past days and you, when we spoke about these purifications and purgations, you're going to really appreciate these, this last passage. Again, from True Devotion to Mary. This devotion is an easy, short, perfect, and secure way at arriving at union with our Lord in which the perfection of, Christian, of the Christian consists goes on to speak about each of those adjectives. It's an easy way. It is the way which Jesus Christ himself trod in coming to us and in which there is no obstacle at arriving at him. It is true that we can attain to divine union by other roads, but it is by many more crosses and strange deaths and with much more difficulties, which we shall find it hard to overcome. We pass through obscure nights, through combats, through strange agonies, over craggy mountains, through cruel thorns, and over frightful deserts. 
Is he not describing the dark night? But by the path of Mary, we pass more gently, more tranquilly. We do find it is true, great battles to fight and great hardships to master, but the good mother and mistress makes herself so present and so near to her faithful servants to enlighten them in their darkness and their doubts, to strengthen them in their fears, and to sustain them in their struggles and their difficulties, that in truth the virginal path to find Jesus Christ is a path of roses and honey compared with the other paths. You talk about hope, my friends. You talk about hope. There have been some saints, but they have been small in numbers, who have passed through the very sweet path, this very, this very sweet path, to go to Jesus because the Holy Spirit, faithful spouse of Mary, has by a singular grace disclosed it to them. They were St. Ephraim, St. John Damascene, St. Bernard, St. Bernadine, St. Bonaventure, St. Francis de Sales, and others. But the rest of the saints, who are the greater number, although they have all had a devotion to Blessed Mary, have not on that account, or at least very little, entered upon this way. He means the way of consecration. This is why they have had to pass through ruder and more dangerous trials. So you see, my friends, but this is not a departure from the Carmelite spirituality. The Carmelites have always been profoundly dedicated to our Blessed Mother. They consider her to be the perfect model of the interior life. And the first Carmelites were hermits. They established their, their community on Mount Carmel in southwest Israel. And there they built individual hermitages and in the center of it, our Blessed Mother. And in fact, St. Simon Stock, an early Carmelite who died in 1265 AD, was entrusted by Mary with the promotion of the brown scapula. So Mary is our key, my friend. She is the hope for total unity with Jesus, available, achievable, possible for everyone. So why would we not take that course? <laughs>